All right. So, thinking about criminal justice systems, right? Um, so we kind of discussed towards the beginning of class and earlier classes that we kind of have like 51 separate criminal justice systems. Some picture as a network, you know, they're all different. It is kind of what it is. That being said, it's hard for us to think in different terms of how to deal with criminals, how to deal with crime, etc. Right? If we look at history, history shows, and we look at other countries, but history shows a really, really um, interesting picture of how we determine whether somebody had committed a crime or not. Not necessarily the punishment, but how they did it, or if they did it. So, historically, cases Right? When one party blames another for doing something, did not require trials. Instead, we have to partigation. We never said it would. We have that. Right? Um, that is basically, that simple definition is uh, swearing an oath that you did not commit an offense. Right? So, that has got two components to it. First, is the swearing of the oath, right? So this is back when people like were terrified of like burning in our alternative if they swore an oath that was false, right? Um, they thought it was like an unforgivable sin. So they took it very seriously, right? Like it wasn't just I'm gonna swear my way out of this. No, no you're not. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's a huge, huge moral obstacle. Now, it kind of evolved. Now, some places use the swearing of the oath, but required that the person who was on trial, not trial, was accused, who was swearing the oath, had to get 12 other members of the community, either who witnessed it or didn't witness it, to swear an oath that they believed him. Right? So where did we get the number 12? Like we're talking juries. We got the number 12 from this. Where did this get the number 12? The disciples. Right? Christ's disciples. There's 12 disciples of Christ. So the idea is if 12 people swore that you were innocent or that they believed your oath, again, they have to swear too, so they're putting their souls in jeopardy theoretically. Then yeah. Theoretically, you have enough weight to say this person's innocent. Now, obviously, that can be manipulated and changed, and as time goes on, you know, we kind of move away from that model. That being said, it is still viable in many legal systems. So, the one instance I, I always mention is Sharia law. So, depending on the offense, if you take my comparative class, we look at different countries and their the criminal justice systems. And have a long lead on Sharia and Sharia law. But Sharia, depending on the, the circumstances, and again, it's very circumstance dependent, you can swear an oath to basically get out of a crime, right? Swear an oath that you didn't do it. And again, it's a deeply religious thing, right? So it's a very deep, hard thing to do when, if you're that committed to your religion. To lie to your God or, or whomever, right? So uh, it's a it's a big deal. Now that being said, you generally get one bite at the apple, right? So Sharia law is going to be usually the less serious crimes. Um, historically, if you got off because you swore an oath and you found all people to swear an oath that they believed you, usually you would get branded or something, right? So the idea is you couldn't then go in and, and commit another crime and then say, oh, I didn't do it, and it starts to look suspicious, the more brand that you have on your arm, right? Um, and the idea is it's also a constant reminder that I either told the truth to my God or I lied to my God, right? It's a constant reminder. So that's kind of how we are looking at history, right? This is, this is very much how we, we kind of uh, dealt with crime. Then we started to evolve. Right? Um, and we started to have trials. Okay. 
That seems great, but it's not like the trials we need to think about today. Right? Trials were either trials by ordeal or trials by combat. So a trial by ordeal, this would be um, a, what, basically giving somebody an impossible task to survive. And the idea is if they were righteous, if they were holy, if God was on their side, they would survive. Right? So think of if you Christian, think of like Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, think of even largely that, but think of, of, of how we dealt with witches in the past. Right? So uh, sometimes we dealt with a witch, what we do is, and this is absolutely terrible. Uh, you get accused of what you screw because what they do is they would take like weights, like uh, rocks, stones, etc., like pile them on you, like wrap them around you, secure them on you, and they then threw your ass into a deep lake. If you floated, you were a witch, and they picked you up and they took you to burn you or whatever they probably wanted to do. If you fucking drowned. You were innocent. Mm -hmm. And people are like, hey, this is a really good idea. I think this is solid. Absolutely. And you said, you can hit me, you're like, what the fuck? Um, so that's a trial by air deal. Uh, they also have trial by combat. Now, we're going to see these, actually, both of these kind of trials come to the modern mortify. So trial by combat is just that. Uh, usually the complaining party will arm themselves um, or they can elect a champion so somebody can fight on their behalf. And the other party would fight that would they agreed on or the other party could elect a champion on their behalf. Right? And then they would if it was people, or if it was a person and a representative, or it was representatives, they would generally fight to the death. Right? And the idea is, basically, kind of a common theme to this, is God controlled it. Right? And the idea was that the victor, whoever won, was ordained by God to win. Because that person was righteous, or that side was righteous. So you see this, like, Game of Thrones, right? You may say that. So, like, I started watching that when I was married to the horrible emo woman, and it, oh, like, I, I just, I, I, I still, to this day, like, I've never watched anything like that, I like, have with this subject. But for every episode, I'd have to ask her, like, what the fuck is going on? Like, there's 90 billion characters with, like, 30 different stories. And, like, I'd have to get explained to me, that, like, the, oh, this is what you missed preview. Like, doesn't tell you shit. It's like, oh, there's Greg. And I go, oh, great. Um, yeah. So, that being said, I do recall one of the times that I didn't fall asleep was there was a trial by combat, right? Um, if you ever see it, like you can probably just find it on YouTube and you know, people are far there. Um, but it's a trial by combat. The idea is somebody's accused of something and God picks the victor. Right? So we see heavy influence, especially Judeo Christian influence, in terms of how we define justice. Now, that being said, trials by ordeal and trials by combat have evolved. We still do them. We just do them in a little bit less batshit crazy way. Okay? So if we think there's really, two, there's really two, two modern iterations of this Judeo-Christian trial system. Okay? So the first one I've heard about is the inquisitorial system. Right? So that derives largely from trial by ordeal. Right? In, in France, is an inquisitorial country. Um, I, my comparative class, and the thing I'm going to try to do in some other classes, I show a video. It's basically just 
filming and it won several awards, the like low level criminal court in France. Right? And what is it, interesting is when you get charged with something in the inquisitorial model, you're guilty until proven innocent. Right? And you bear the burden of proving your innocence. But the judges assume you're guilty from the get-go. You do have defense counsel, but they generally can't speak to the court. They might be able to tell you some things, but that, that's about it. The prosecutor can usually say to the court what they think happened and what they think the punishment should be, but they don't ask questions. Neither side asks questions. The judge, or judges, depending on the severity, they ask questions. Right? So they presume that you're guilty, and they just start hammering you with questions, and you're supposed to, through those questions, demonstrate your innocence. Not the greatest. Um, better track record than our system. Uh, but that's the idea is you're doing a trial by ordeal, right? If you come out of this inquisitorial chamber, it's, it's called the chamber, you come out of the chamber and you're still alive, you're not punished, right? you got acquitted, you survived the ordeal. Right? The ordeal was being subject to the inquisitorial system. Um, now when we say this, a lot of people think of like, <laughs> inquisitorial systems in terms of spreading religion, right? So um, it was we kind of had an old system before we got to like the not that crazy system, where it was like um, I don't think I have a word this. It's during the it's called the Inquisition, right? If anybody wants to put the position on it's called the Inquisition. So during the Inquisition. Basically, group of like hardcore Christians, like a luxury, like fucking army, um, basically went around Europe, kind of going door to door, and being like, "You believe in God? No, nope. you're dead. You believe in God? Yep. You believe in our God? No, nope. you're dead." Like, and that's just what they did. Like that was the Inquisition, right? And that's where we kind of get the name from, right? Of, of you're getting questioned, right? You have something at stake in the Inquisition of your life, um, and a lot of times it's penalties, fines, jail time, whatever. Um, and the Inquisition is in, the Inquisitorial system is interesting because the judges can be creative in their um, solutions, uh, sentences. So a judge can order a community service and things like that. A judge can order you to AA. A judge can order you to go to church. A judge can order you to go to the supermarket. I mean, they can like come up with whatever they need to do. The idea is to remedy and make it right. And so what's interesting about the clinical system is when it comes to crime, especially low level. When it comes to crime, there's how do we word this? Um, the civil aspect, right, to be super money damages. So, like, let's say somebody comes up and punches you in the face, right? Like some of you probably want to do that in my little email, right? Somebody comes and punches me in the face. That's a crime, right? But I can also sue them. Right, for damages to my face, emotional distress, you name it, right? In the United States, and we're going to see in, in, in uh, the adversarial system, so we separate the processes, right? Criminal and civil are separate. In the inquisitorial system, they're the same. So basically, each side prepares what's called a dossier to the judge, but it gives facts and what they've investigated, blah, blah, blah. The re judge reads the dossier, begins the inquisition, the questioning. Uh, and then determines guilt or innocence, but at the same time, determines civil liability. 
So if you watch it, the, the the video I have, um, there's it's low level offenses that are hilarious. Like the people they found were like the funniest crime. Uh, and they weren't trying to be funny, but like, they were really funny. Uh, so you have this one guy who and apparently apparently in France it is illegal to swear at a meter range. Right? Like the ones are for you know how they call them. People go around giving tickets, right, for the parking illegally or going over time. Well, this guy apparently went up like this. The lady was riding him with tickets because his time had expired on the, on the street. Riding him with his ticket, she hands it to him. He calls her a bitch. The police hear it, drag his ass to court, right? And so he's found guilty, like, during this incident, like, he's he just, he just kind of like, yeah, my bad. Blah, blah. So he admitted it. She, they imposed a fine, right? And how they impose their fines are interesting. They don't just, like, in the United States, when you say, like, oh, you owe this person $5,000, and you're expected to, like, come up with it immediately. Not there. Their fine system is based upon how much money you make. The idea is the more money you make, the more money that you can afford to fork over as a fine. Right? Idea is five thousand dollars to you and me is a lot of money. Five thousand dollars to Bill Gates or Warren Buffett is nothing. Right? So what's the deterrent value? So they they kind of do a sliding scale. So she gives them a fine, and then the meter maid comes up, the judge calls the meter maid up, the meter maid comes up to the in front of court. Of course, everybody's in the black and like robes and stuff like that. And the judge said, How did this make you feel? She was like, It made me feel sad. And the judge was like, Okay, now you have to pay her 250 euro. And then uh, francs. Yeah, francs. You have to pay her 250 francs. And that was it. Again, the whole case was over. Like, that, was, that was just it. They were done. Like, two questions and like, and eh, we'll figure out your fine and pay this person money because you cursed at them. So like, I'm never doing France because my ass you get electrocuted. <laughs> so that's kind of the inquisitorial system. And the idea is all parties participate, so there's no right to get self-discrimination or anything like that. All right, so again, it kind of comes from trial by appeal. The United States, we have an adversarial system. Right? We evolved from trials by combat. And think about the American trial. You have one party on one side, a party on the other side. They disagree about something, or they accuse somebody of something, right? Party A, let's say the prosecution, elects an attorney, right? And the attorney goes into court. The defendant elects an attorney, gets an attorney. That in front of the attorney goes to court. They represent them, right? So they have champions. We have champions now, which is called lawyers. Right? And then when we get to court, we have our trial by combat. Right? We presume that the party is innocent. They don't have to prove anything. The burden of proof is obviously on the prosecution, but they do get out, right? Through questioning, through presenting evidence. And they show the 12 jurors. Uh, hearkening way back, right, to the disciples, the evidence, right? And theoretically, the jurors are supposed to be intelligent people going into this part of the class, we're talking about the courts, or you take my judicial process class, we're talking about how stupid jurors are. They're basically mean guys. Um, so, yeah, you're theoretically showing these people, and they're supposed to come to this rational decision, and, and there's some, it used to be kind of we used to make you swear on oath, right, on, on the Bible or the Quran or whatever it's holy to you. We've kind of omitted that largely. Most courts now just try to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. They left out the sale of the God part. Um, some courts still make you swear an oath on, on the Bible or the Quran or whatever religion you have. Some religions are can't swear oaths. They're prevented from swearing oaths. Well, like, it is against their religion. They think it's an affront to God if you swear no. So for them, we just need affirmation. Right? So you affirm that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And then that's cool. Like we change one word, but we literally mean the same thing. Right? And the idea is we subject them to perjury. So 
Maybe God won't get you if you're a lion, but we will. Right? It's kind of the idea behind it. There's still that punishment that derives from that oath. Now, we do, in the adversarial system, have due process of the law. So due process of law is best thought of as, as two kind of separate components that make up one giant component. Right? To due process of law, we have procedural fairness and substantive fairness. So procedural fairness is all the rule books you have to learn in English, right? Um, it is procedurally, did we go through each step to ensure that your rights weren't violated, right? And we look to make sure. Substantive due process says, yeah, this isn't necessarily a right, or this isn't necessarily a step in the proceedings, or this is not how the rules say proceedings go, but it's unfair. For you to do this to them, right? So we want to make sure that our trials are procedurally correct, that they are all the same in terms of how they proceed, but we also want to make sure that they're fair. And defendants can raise due process questions at any point, right? And then talk about procedural fairness. Um, so we'll talk about, just for, just for example, we'll get to it later, um, trying to decide the difference between procedural fairness and substantive fairness. So let's say, um body kit. So we'll do this. So please find a kid that had been torn open with a chainsaw. Right? Obviously dead. A kid torn with a chainsaw. Okay. Police officer gets called by the prosecution, right? And testifies about what he saw and what he did. The procedure is when he's done. The defense gets to cross examine and ask questions, right? That's procedural fairness. We, we go by the rules. Then we have substantive fairness. Because let's say, procedurally, you can admit anything that's relevant into evidence. So let's say I have photos of the dead child, like the Fedora from my chain. Maybe the eating or the fire I don't know. They're like really gruesome, bloody photos of a child. And I'm the prosecutor. I'm putting, I'm blowing that shit up to be about this big, and I'm putting it in front of the jury, right? And the idea for me, from the prosecutor's perspective, is it's going to so emotionally prejudice the jury. They're going to see that kid, and they're going to, I mean, one vomit, cry, and, and then fucking convict, right? I'm the defense attorney. I object. I say it's more prejudicial than probative. Basically, he's saying it's not fair. This isn't fair. This isn't right. right. So do they have the do they have the right to give the evidence? Yeah, they do. But blowing it up, presenting to the jury in such a way and pointing out the gruesome details of it, that's not fair. We know the kid died. We know how. We don't necessarily need to see it. Right? So that really comes into a, a big issue in different trials is crime scene photos. It's one of the biggest issues is, is it fair? Is it fair to show crime scene photos? So it, it's, it's an interesting, interesting mix. But together, the process and the fairness make up due process, which again is the hallmark of the adversarial system, right? We're all about giving you rights and the presumptions, whereas the inquisitorial system, not so much. So, looking at criminal due process, right? In the Middle Ages, due process literally meant adhering to the laws of the land. Right? That was due process. Wherever you were, whatever the law of the land said was how you get tried or whatever, as long as they followed that, you had due process. Right, so maybe I walk in and I accuse somebody of stealing my coat. And in this fictional country, if the person blinks within three minutes, they're guilty. Okay. You can't complain about it. You follow the process. Right? Um, Middle Ages, this feels very difficult for a few reasons. One, we have lords and serfs, right? 
the idea was, well, if you don't like the criminal process in this country, you can go to another country. Or like people who say, America, love or leave it, right? It was like that. It was like, but only middle age stock. Right? So, but, but we can move. Theoretically, the service really couldn't. Right? Most people were impoverished and, and didn't have that love. In addition, due process included torture. Right? Middle ages, we can torture the hell out of you. Um, as long as it was in the law of the land. Right? It's interesting is each lord like in a country might have different laws for his land. So we probably not even have unified law in a country, right? This lord says, I'll torture you, this one does anyone. Okay, so well, this. Now we know that torture, torture is really problematic because torture leads to false confessions that they were within them, right? The idea is, and the, if you ever want to look at some, like, some of the shit they used to be saying, um, like there was one that's, uh, they were torturing him, and it was like, I think it's a copper bowl, like, looks like a fucking bowl, like, move, move, bowl. Um, and they put, like, the guy inside, and then they lit a fire underneath the bowl. And, like, they would say, oh, we'll let you out if you confess. Because generally speaking, whenever the bowl made a, like a angry roar sound is because the person had started, I mean, had died, and the liquidy part was starting to boil in their system, creating steam. So, like, they did some really messed up stuff. Like the Iron Maiden, which is basically a casket with spikes, breaking on the wheel, literally putting you on a giant wooden wheel and cranking, like, your back, and cranking it around the floor and, and breaking your vertebrae one by one. Um, it was really successful in the sense that people confess, right? Like, it was me, I walk into a, like, a torture chamber, I'm like, no, fuck it, I did it, I did it, I don't give a shit, I did it, right? And public torture is often kill people. But it was kind of choose how you die, right? Because if you admit it to it, then most crimes carry the death penalty. So you're going to die. So it's like, do I want to die in this way, in this gruesome, horrible fashion, or do I want to die in this gruesome, horrible fashion? The Middle Ages were a great time to be alive. Um, yeah, so it is what it is. Our modern concept of due process stems from this, right? In the sense that we're like, that's real fucked up. So that's why we see kind of the, the modern day iteration of due process. No torture, theoretically. We'll talk about that. Um, theoretically, no torture, right? You're presumed innocent. We'll give you your rights. Because we saw what happened before. And what happened before is really, really messed up. So we see the Bill of Rights, specifically the Fifth Amendment. Um, at the time, the federal constitution, the US Constitution, for until like the what, 1960s ish? Yeah. Um, the federal constitution only applied to the federal government. Right, we're talking up, up until like some, my dad was born in 1951. Like when he was born, the US constitution only applied to the federal government. All right? So, the federal government couldn't establish an official religion. State could, right? Um, the federal government theoretically had to provide you an attorney. States didn't have to. Most states didn't do it. Uh, you got charged with a crime. So if you read the text of the Fifth Amendment, you get an attorney. Um, but only if you're charged with a federal crime. If it's a low-level crime or excuse me, state crime, it's up to the state. Right, so this is part of the problem we had when we had the Articles of Confederation, that fell apart, and then we kind of started criminal due process from an ad hoc perspective. Right? So we went through a process what's known as selective incorporation. Right? And basically this comes after the Civil War. 
right? The Civil War just showed how bad our Constitution and was written, right? In the sense that we had a Confederacy, we had like it was just this weird blob of we each state does their own damn thing. So when we get the Civil War amendments, right? Specifically Amendment 14. Amendment 14 says no person shall be deprived of due process life, property, or due process of law. Or without due process of law. That's exactly what the words of the Fifth Amendment. So then there was a question of, huh, does the Bill of Rights apply to the states now? And what the Supreme Court does and says is, um, kind of. Basically, it goes right by race that you have now in the criminal justice system. Like, you are to an attorney. We didn't just have the Civil War and like, yeah, the Fifth Amendment says the same thing as the 14th Amendment. We said, no, we're going to go right by right and decide right by right what rights you have and what constitutes our due process of law. So it's called selective incorporation, right? Do we incorporate the Fifth Amendment? Do we incorporate all the Fifth Amendment? Go play part of the Fifth Amendment. We incorporate the Fourth Amendment. Right? And we just see case after case after case. So, what we see, um, we see some very famous cases. Uh, Howe v. Alabama, it's a 1932 case. This was partial incorporation of the Sixth Amendment. Um, basically, right to counsel clause. And basically, what we said, Howe v. Alabama, is if you has some kind of mental, let's get legal terminology, legal, mental defect or disease. And you couldn't understand the proceedings. Like you were illiterate, you couldn't understand the proceedings, like you couldn't do this. States had to provide you counsel. But if you could maybe read, write, had the capacity to understand what was happening, states didn't have to give you counsel. All right, so that was our first whack at, like, you get the right to counsel. Like we haven't had the right to counsel that long. Um, so we say, like, eh, this sort of case is states, you have to. And Supreme Court's like, you have to. Then we get full incorporation right, of the amendment in Gideon versus Wainwright. So Gideon versus Wainwright, basically this low level offender in Florida. Um, like represents himself in court because he can't afford an attorney. He's accused of breaking into the Bay Harbor pool room and smashing the vending machine and taking the coins. Right? And he represents himself, like he goes like he, first he starts objecting saying, like, no, I get an attorney. The Constitution says that I have to have an attorney. And judge is like, not in Florida. And so he represents himself, did a decent job actually. Um, but he's found guilty, ultimately sentenced like five years in the state pen. Well, in the state pen, he wrote on notebook paper, basically, a petition to the U.S. Supreme Court saying that this is not right. I should have been provided counsel. Right? So what happens is the Supreme Court, he was, it, was, it was done in papyrus, right? which basically means in the form of a papyrus. So the Supreme Court has rules, right? You have to have certain margin, it has to be a certain type bond, has to have these appendices. I mean, they're just crazy strict rules. If you don't follow even one of them, they'll throw out your case. They won't even listen to it. Right? And most cases don't get heard by the Supreme Court. Right? You get like tens of thousands of petitions a year. Of that, they hear maybe a hundred. So his went in, and everyone gets considered, they talk about it. Um, and one of the justices at the time was very Oh, uh, because Chief Justice are all wrong, I don't to say that. Um, very criminal rights oriented, right? He believed that everybody had lots and lots and lots of rights. So he jumped on this case and was like, yeah, we're taking it. Four justices agreed, called the rule of four, and they heard the case. Right? And Gideon, once they hear the case, once they hear the case, suddenly his case is no longer a state case. All right, because the U.S. Supreme Court is taking it up, now a federal case. So now that he has a federal case, 
he gets a lawyer. So the lawyer argues in front of the Supreme Court, Gideon never leaves prison like he stays there. The lawyer argues in front of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ultimately comes down and says, Gideon deserves a new attorney, or an attorney. Give him a new trial. And that was like shockwaves over the country. Because suddenly, what that meant was every state has to give you a lawyer. Right? If you're indigent. Um, fun fact. Gideon gets retried, gets found innocent, and another person confesses to the crime. So like he was wrongfully convicted. All right, and that was the whole point of the right to counsel was to keep people from being wrongfully convicted. So like it was kind of this weird like sweet justice story. Um, but yeah, I mean, so two years of his life in prison, but he got out. Um, then we kind of see Plato v. Connecticut. This lays the foundation uh, for corporation of basically all of the Bill of Rights. All right, so basically we lay this nice foundation um, where we say, okay, now the rest of the Bill of Rights applies to the states. This is basically an 18 minute issue. Um, then we see Matt v. Ohio, 1951. It's the incorporation of the exclusionary rule. Right? The exclusionary rule is like the Tom McKay study. Uh, it's the basically if police seize evidence illegally, um, they don't have a warrant or something like that. That evidence can't come in against you. Right? That's the exclusionary rule. Right? So let's say they come search your house without a warrant, find your big pile of drugs, arrest you. Your attorney's going to say, motion is arrest. They didn't have a warrant. They couldn't enter the house. Judge is going to agree and go, yep. So the drugs can't come into evidence. So you're the prosecutor. How do you prove possession of drugs without being able to talk about the drugs? Right, so the case ultimately gets dismissed. Now, the idea behind this exclusionary rule that, that again, comes out in the 1960s, during what we call the criminal justice revolution, um, was to deter police misconduct. Right, so the idea that police put so much time and money and effort into each case. And the exclusionary rule can ruin the case. Right, so the idea is like, I just put two years of my life into that. Or like, yeah, but maybe you should have followed the Constitution. Right, so that's what we're kind of punishing police is the, is the idea behind it. We're not really rewarding offenders. That being said, we kind of see this again, this evolution of the criminal justice system in the 1960s, under Chief Justice Earl Warren, and then a little bit later under Berger. But due process basically guides every step of the criminal justice process. So this is what the criminal justice process looks like. Right? So, theoretically, up here, let's say a crime is committed. Okay? Theoretically, a crime is committed. Maybe not, but how many claims a crime is committed? We begin with the pre arrest investigation. Right? So, this is where search and seizure comes into play. Right? This is where I'm serving a search warrant, I'm searching your property, I'm searching your car, whatever it is. And the idea is we're gathering evidence. And once we have enough evidence to reach probable cause, which is basically 50.01% sure that this person committed a crime, then we can move on to the arrest. Now there are procedures and processes in place for the arrest. Right? So we all have watched TV, and we all are probably very set to Miranda rights. Right? Miranda rights, you have the right to make time. Can you say, can we give to your lawyer or attorney? Can't force them, you want to be right to you before the questioning. Do you have any questions? That's my answer. Right, so the Supreme Court in the 60s came up with that. Part of this criminal justice revolution. So part of the 1960s, like half the stuff like that we enjoy in terms of thinking it's protecting innocent people didn't exist. Like you were on your own. You got charged with a crime, the state got a lawyer, you didn't. So like it was a big change. Right? So once we make an arrest. We read Miranda, that means that the right to counsel attaches. Okay? Give it up to a lawyer starting at that point. Then we move from arrest, physically cuffing somebody and moving them to the rest. So cuffing somebody, taking them downtown to booking. Okay? Right? Booking is where we take your mug shots, get your fingerprints, name, height, weight, see if you have any medical conditions, all that stuff before. Put you into the actual jail, right? So it's kind of like a reflection test. 
Not a fun one. Then from booking, and you're kind of sitting in jail for a little bit, um, maybe a couple hours, maybe a day, before your initial appearance. Usually the initial appearance, unless there's a really good reason, usually the appearance has to occur it's called without delay. Right? Um, once you're arrested, it has to occur without delay. Meaning, we have to break your ass before a judge right away. Right? So you book, you the jail, we bring you before a judge right away. We might even bring you before a judge before you book it. Like, that's how important the initial appearance is. That initial appearance, a few things happen. Okay? First thing that happens is you are, I don't know what but um, first thing that happens in, in the initial appearance, you See the judge. The judge reviews what evidence there is to see if there's probable cause to hold you. Right? The judge has to agree. Yeah. Okay. I see 51 percent here. But at this point, initial appearance, the right to counsel attaches. Like in the sense of, you could ask for a lawyer when you're being questioned, or you can get a lawyer now. Right? You ask for. Usually, this is where we point the lawyer. Right? So. If you get questioned by the police saying, I don't want to answer any more questions, I'll have an attorney, they don't go get you an attorney. They just arrest you and make you through initial appearance where you get an attorney. Um, so this is where you get your attorney. Sometimes you can enter in pleas. Just depends on where you're at in terms of felony, misdemeanor, state. Um, then we have kind of a bifurcated. System. Um, put it this way. So we have states that have what are called grand juries, and that's how they decide whether or not they're going to prosecute somebody after an arrest. Okay? Other states don't have grand juries. It's up to the prosecutor's discretion whether or not to prosecute somebody after an arrest. So if we are in a jurisdiction, a state that doesn't use grand juries, a grand jury, think of, okay, so like jury duty stuff. Grand jury duty is horrible. So like grand juries, it can be 20, 30 people in a room, and all they do is hear case after case all day. The prosecutor just says, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened, here's the evidence, this is like the defense doesn't get a say or anything like that. The prosecutor presents this evidence to these people, and they kind of sit in a group like this, and then they vote. Should we try him? Should we indict him? Basically, it's called the indictment. Um, or should we issue what's called a no bill? Meaning, we're not indicting. Um, that's grand juries, right? They're citizens, they're stupid, but grand juries can serve up to two years. So, you like grand, like jury duty, you might have to do it for three days, like worst case scenario. Um, best case scenario is like, a year and a half in grand jury duty. So I mean, they range times where they can meet and things like that around people's schedules. But yeah, they that's what they do. They just sit for years and decide. And they're just randomly drawn. Right? Um, the feds use the grand jury system. And so that's the one I kind of always go back to. Um, the feds use the grand jury to indict. Again, it depends on the state. Um, after they indict, then we move to the arraignment. All right. Um, if they don't indict, then the person is theoretically let go, although we can call a brand new grand jury and reinvestigate them. Um, there's no double jeopardy that attaches at this stage. So, again, indict, piece of paper, it's a formal charging document, right? Like, it tells you what you're being charged with, maybe gives some explanation why, but it's a form um, that you can look at later. In non-grand jury jurisdictions, we have the preliminary hearing. Right? So the preliminary hearing is like a mini trial in the sense that there's a judge, there's no jury, there's a prosecutor, there's a defendant, and the defense attorney. Prosecutor gets up, calls witnesses, questions them. The defense can question the witnesses as well. But the defense can't call any witnesses. 
right? So it can like attack the credibility of someone, but it can't say, oh, I have a witness who, I have a witness who says I didn't do it, right? They can't do that. And the idea here is they have to convince a judge that you have met the threshold, like that they can prove that you're guilty, right? Um, there was a famous saying, and, and if you have a ticket, you never have a choice, but if you don't, but if you get one, it's better to have the preliminary hearing. Right, trouble reasons. First, grand juries occur in secret. Second, a famous New York judge once said, and this gets repeated in every law school, a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich, meaning they will literally indict every case. Like they don't even discuss it half the time. I don't know yet. And then you be like, so you kind of screwed there. And you don't get to be there, right? Your lawyer doesn't get to be there anyway. The arraignment, the prosecution basically puts on its side. Your defense attorney knows exactly who they're going to call, what they're going to say, and then you start thinking of questions to ask and how to move what it's going to do. So you get like a mini trial, like you like have a, like a, a mold, right? So that's a preliminary hearing. Now, if the preliminary hearing, the judge says there's probable cause, then you move into the arraignment. If the grand jury issues an indictment, then you move into the arraignment, right? So we kind of bifurcate and we come back to the same thing. So we go into the arraignment. The arraignment is where you are formally told what you're being charged with. It's also the point where you enter a plea. Like guilty, not guilty, or no low contender. Right? Meaning no contest. No contest is basically I didn't do it, but I recognize you have enough evidence to convict me, so I'm not going to fight it. The idea behind it is it's to help rich people, right? So it's it's if you're found guilty, it can come in civil court, right? So um, let's say you murder somebody and you're a multi-billionaire, right? You say no contendere. We can't use that in the civil trial. I'm going to try to get all of your money, right, for killing whomever. If, I, if you come guilty, I can absolutely use that in my civil trial. So there is like some benefit to no contender. So those are your pleas, right? So you just get home, but you already know going into it what you're getting charged with. But this is part of the process, right? It's a slow moving system. The idea is to ensure your rights along the way. So we have the arraignment. And then we get to a theoretical trial. 99.9% um, .9 of cases end right here. Right? So, 5 to 1, depending on which statistics you look at, 5 or 1 to 5, I would say, percent of cases go to trial. Right? So, most Cases are resolved via plea bargaining. Right? Plea bargaining, the, the prosecutor says, okay, look, if you get found guilty of this crime, you're facing life in prison. Or you can't change that, change that. If you found guilty of this crime, you face the death penalty. But if you agree not to go to trial and to change your plea to guilty, we will ensure that you get life in prison. That's a rough one, right? I mean, especially if you're innocent. Like, and we've, been, we've executed innocent people quite a bit. Um, some, some legal commentators uh, refer to plea bargaining as modern day torture. Right? It's like, say you did it, say you did it, and it's not going to hurt as much. Right? Um, so most, most cases in there are going to be a good Of the 1 to 5 percent, we move on, we move on to a trial. Right? And we all know the trial, prosecution goes first, presents their evidence, defense gets asked questions, and the defense goes, they present their evidence, and the prosecution gets asked questions, and the arguments. Then the jury retires, deliberates, theoretically, you find the person guilty, not guilty. 
but that's the hung jury. From there, they find the person guilty. We go to sentencing, and you have special rights at sentencing, and we'll talk about that in a later class, and then you can start your appeals process. Yeah. And the idea is, at each one of these stages, you have different rights. And you get afforded more rights, different rights, kind of as you go on. That's procedural due process mixed with the substantive due process. So this is just the arrest process. Um, again, it comes from your book. Uh, it's not overly complicated. Most of you can understand it. But there is an offense or suspected offense reported to the police. It'll go to an investigation, or the case will just be unsolved and there's no suspect or inadequate, inadequate evidence, and it ends. If it goes to investigation, we still might find that it's inadequate or we just have to drop it. If it, we decide to pursue it, we get a warrant issued by the court um, based on probable cause. And then from there, if there's probable cause, we get the warrant, we can make the arrest. Right? Not overly complicated. Then there's the trial process. The trial process, in this one, it begins with the grand jury. Right? Initial appearance, which we just talked about. Then to the preliminary hearing. We do have chances for diversion. So theoretically, the charges could be dropped. Uh, the offender could get diverted out of the justice system. So this would be like the judge saying, you know, if, 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 if you agree to complete this program, like AA or something like that, we'll erase your charges, right? We'll make, they'll be dismissed. It does have diversion. It's, it's different pretrial programs that fear to get Get cases out. Like judges don't want to go to trial. People don't want to go to trial. Trials cost them a lot of money. So, assuming that you don't get diverted, then you have a trial, or your guilty plea is accepted, or you can be acquitted. Okay? If you are found guilty, you can be your get sentence. Um, generally, after a pre sentence investigation, and then once you have your sentence in place, and your guilty verdict in place, then you can file post-trial appeals. So this is just what the sentencing process looks like. Again, you find somebody guilty, they're filing a post-trial appeal, which might stop us from imposing punishment right away. Right? It's called a stay. It might stay us from imposing punishment. Or more often than not, we go through with our punishment while the appeal is, is processed. Okay. So there's two kind of types of sentences. There's institutional sentences, right? Uh, this is where we're committing somebody usually to a correctional facility, right? To a jail or a prison. Or we have community corrections, right? Depending on the offender, how we evaluate them, we might just give them probation, which they call supervision in the community, probation, parole, reentry, basically saying, like, okay, yeah, you did it, but you don't belong in a prison, you know, go do this, go do community service, get random searches, all of that, still go to prison, okay? And then if you do go to prison, then you can move back up and, and do a post-trial appeal. So if you go through the punishment and one of the phases of it, that's when you would appeal. That being said, after your exam, we will start talking about the three big components of the criminal justice system. Right, we're going to turn pretty quickly because we're going to talk about them in depth. Right? So we're first going to talk about police. You'll have a couple of chapters on the police. Then you'll have your second exam. So all you have to know is the police. Like, you're walking up on yeah. And then for your final exam, you're going to move after police move into the courts. Right, so we're kind of following the trial process. Move into the courts, then we'll move into sentencing and capital punishment, things like that. We'll have debate days. Uh, we might have a guest speaker, depending on how that plays out. Um, it depends on if he's in prison or not, again. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll see how that plays out. And we'll kind of end with the question of ethics, right, the criminal justice system. We get to the national system. So, being said, Next class.
is your exam, regardless if it's Mountain Day, I mean, if it's Mountain Day, then it's Friday, get it in by 215. 